Hi, I'm Courtney Webster, and this is Your Recovered Life, and today I am so happy to be joined by Elizabeth Edwards. Let me tell you a little bit about her, and then we'll get right to it. I'm going to read. Elizabeth Edwards is an award-winning singer-songwriter known for her graceful, melodic style and rich vocals. She was chosen to participate in the Lilith Fair's talent search hosted by Bill Graham Presents and has performed on stages all across the country. She's open for the late Dan Fogelberg and other songwriting legends, and she was awarded a, gr a grant by the State of California Arts Council as an artist in residence where she taught songwriting to teens. Her new, her new CD, House of Mirrors, is available on iTunes, and it's great. She plays both as a solo unplugged artist as well as with a band focusing on her original compositions and to quote music critics and her fans, her music is empowering and refreshing, heartfelt and inspirational, and a cut above the rest. And I'm so happy you're here with us today. So thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, so I met Elizabeth at, um, I was at this dinner and we were just having a nice time and I was so happy, I was, at a, as I was there, I didn't know anybody. And um, I was seated, I had to sit at this table and I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna know anybody. And you know, you get seated pe next to people and you just never know, you're like, oh God, this is the longest dinner ever. And it was gonna be a really long dinner. So I sit down and this woman sits down and we kind of started talking before and we're sitting next to each other and we just were like, got on like a house on fire and you just have the greatest energy and it was so, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I get to sit next to you at dinner too. And, um, and then as we talked a little bit more, I told you about this project and you were so wonderful. You were like, oh yeah, I'd tell you my story. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about it and I'm really happy you're here to share it with everybody. So thanks. Well, thank, you. thank you for asking me. And I, we had a great time. It was, uh, it was a, a nice evening and yeah, it was a lot of fun. Cool. All right. So the first question I like to ask is, have you found your calling? How I found my calling. Hmm. My calling, um, well, I'll tell you what I believe my calling is. Um, I love performing, but I think what my real calling is, is I'm a songwriter. I'm a songwriter first. And when I, um, at about seven years into my recovery, I was really, had a lot of angst and a lot of internal um, feelings of unfulfillment and I felt afraid to move forward because I wasn't sure what that was supposed to be. But what I did know was that I had, I had from childhood been a songwriter. I started writing songs before I ever had any kind of problems with addiction. And so what happened was I, I kind of went right back to that, but I didn't, um, I didn't embrace it. It actually scared me because part of my uh, addiction story uh, also was tied to the music industry and was tied to not so much the industry, but the music world of performance and stuff. And so going back to songwriting felt like the safest part of that because as, as growing up, I had been very involved in performance and music, um, but I had had so many problems during that time in my life that I'd associated my, my problems with addiction to what I was doing. Um, so I went kind of back to the most basic part of my creative nature, which is songwriting. And I thought, okay, I'm going to play it really safe. I'll just write my little songs and I'll put them on cassette and I'll send them to some you know publishers and stuff. So that's kind of how I started. And I didn't want anyone to know I was doing it. I was, I was very private about it. Um, I joined an organization that kind of really nurtured songwriting and I really kind of stayed um, in the mentality of just this kind of under the radar, I want to write songs thing. And every publisher who heard the music said, good song, you know, it's a good song, you're a good songwriter. Not great song, but good song, um, great voice. And I heard that over, and I would be so disappointed because I didn't want to sing because I'd done that and I didn't trust my emotional uh, strength at that time to put myself out there in that way. Um, but over a period of a couple of years, I really started working at the craft of the songwriting and I started working at uh, kind of working with other songwriters and I kept getting that same feedback. And then through um, uh, kind of a fluke friendship, um, the manager of a well-known 12-step uh, comedian, or he wasn't well-known at the time, but he is now, um, heard one of my cassette tapes and it was a song called Power to Change. And uh, Mark Lundholm, who was a 12-step comedian, heard the uh, song and said, do you think she would open for me? And here I'm like just trying to stay in studios and do little demos for other artists. And 
the, this woman asked me if I would do that, and I said, yeah. And so I, then I was scared to death, and I stood in front of like, you know, 1,500 people and played one song and thought I was going to have a heart attack. And people would come up to me afterwards and say, where can we buy your CD? And I didn't have one, but I had all these demos. And what came out of my mouth was, oh, well, I'm working on it. I'll have it pretty soon. Here's, write your phone number and name. And it was back in the uh, snail mail days. And so I started with an, a mailing list and started making CDs. And that's pretty much how it happened. Right. So, me on this path. So you've given me the cliff note versions. Mm -hmm. And uh, now what I want to do is break it down because mm -hmm. um, what what part of what made me really curious about how people found their calling is when I got into recovery, I would, everything got better, right? I got, everything got a lot better. Yeah. And then I still feel that I felt like something was missing. Like I was being called to something, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what was calling, but I had that unrest and I would see people in meetings talking and it seemed like they had found their thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I got really, and so I just, I kind of wanted to know, like, how, how did you do it? How, how did that happen? So mm -hmm. I'd love it if you could break it down from when you, um, when you got into recovery and then what happened there. Cause, cause I know there's some backstory. Like, as you said, you had been a singer um, and a performer growing mm -hmm. up and then mm -hmm. you went away from it. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you got into recovery and then it was like, so when you got into recovery, did you feel, what did you feel like in terms of a calling? Did, what did you feel like? Did you, I'm kind of talking too much now, but. <laughs> yeah, but let, let me, let me just step in there. Yeah. Um, what happened for me was as a child, I had a voice um, that was recognizably talented and teachers and parents and community stepped in and I, I actually ended, I had a lot of nice opportunities to perform in front of large audiences, uh, you know, as early as 14, 15 years old. Um, you know, I competed in international jazz festivals at 15, 16 years old as a soloist. Um, and so, but I also had developed a pretty severe addiction problem. Um, and so, right around that same time, so like with everybody who gets addicted, addiction takes over and the things that are important and the things that are part of who you are become very much uh, backseat. And pretty, for me, they it actually completely went away because I'm completely just you know, kind of a dysfunctional, <laughs> totally dysfunctional. I'm not a functioning um, addict. I'm a, I'm a person who can't function at all, pretty much. So anyway, um, so that all went away. So by the time I um, got into recovery at 25, I was 25 years old when I got into recovery, I had, you know, just trusting myself to do the basics in life was a big deal for me. And so I started, you know, one foot in front of the other, baby steps, putting it together. Um, but one of the things that was really difficult for me was to trust myself with what I wanted because my will had taken me, you know, being so strong-willed in the addiction, um, I, I, mis I learned to mistrust my own judgment. And so it took me a number of years just to even trust my feelings about anything. And um, so at seven years, I had come to kind of that place in, in recovery for me, at least I've heard a lot of other people kind of getting to that place where you're either going to move forward in recovery or you're probably going to fall apart and go back out. I was at that place. And part of that process was part of what was going on, on on the inside for me was I was really struggling um, with creative angst. I'm you know, a highly creative person and I just didn't have a place for that to go, but I was afraid to look at it because I didn't trust myself. I had tied that to the addiction. So here's this beautiful gift you know, that I believe God gave me, um, but I had tied this to this big problem in my mind. Um, were there conversations you were having in your head about it? Can you recall? Oh, yeah. It was just like, you can't do that because you'll risk your sobriety, you'll risk your life, you'll risk what you've built. You're, you're stable, finally. Don't, don't risk all this. And what was the voice saying, I want you to do? The vo it was conflicting. It was one part of me was saying, you need to move forward. This is what you need to do. This is what you wanted to do. And the other parts go, no, you've got to find something safer than this. This isn't safe. 
And so it was all fear fighting with uh, calling, basically. And so I started doing a lot of work on it. And um, through the process of a lot of reading, a lot of, you know, um, prayer and meditation, a lot of meeting with, um, you know, sponsors and different people and doing some pretty deep inventory work looking at that and what that was about. I had, I think, you know, basic some psychic surgery. You know, I, I really do believe in a spiritual solution to addiction. I believe that for me it was the only solution and it worked for me. Um, and what happened is in that sixth and seventh step in the 12 steps where that part where, you know, I can't fix it, but you can become completely ready to have that healed in you, that got healed in me. And what that looked like was I went from being full of fear and self, uh, a self-centeredness that, that was just pretty much afraid to move forward, but in so much pain I couldn't stay stuck. I was in that place. Um, I, I just got free from that. And what really came through for me was I got it loud and clear that when, when whatever you want to call God, I call it God, higher power gives you a gift. It's not because you're so uniquely wonderful, although I think we all are uniquely wonderful. It's because that's the gift he wants you to bring to the party of life. And so it's not about you getting something. It's about you giving something. And when I got that energy about that right, it just shifted the whole thing for me. And it just, it became, I don't have to be afraid of this. And uh, this huge, huge shift. And I've never cool. thought about it any other way since then. Cool. It, so, it was like, yeah, spiritual surgery on the head here. So. I haven't heard spiritual surgery, but yeah. <laughs> I have the idea of that. No blood, no yeah. anesthesia. Um, when you were having conversations, you said you were having a lot of conversations with sponsors and, you know, so what was the conversation like? Because I want, I, I would love for people who are in that place where maybe they're feeling like, I think I want to do this thing, but that, but feeling the conflict, just like you're talking yeah. about. So I'd love to hear if you could just kind of put some words to it. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, that I'm, you know, I think it's easy to get caught up in this and, and I certainly was caught up in this. Um, and it would be like, I would think I would know all the things that would have to happen. And I would play this whole future trip out in front of me, like it's gonna happen like this and I can't handle this. So when I get to this point, you know, I would just have so much fear moving forward, I would stop myself from moving forward. And what I learned to do was the how is absolutely, you, you'll you never, I love to look back now going, oh, I would have never thought that. Oh, I wouldn't dream that one up in a million years, right? Because in reality, you have no idea how it's gonna go down. All you have to do is set the intention and be willing to follow your intuition because that's, for me, how God talks to me is through my intuition and just follow that, follow your heart, follow your intuition, don't worry about the how and just know that if, if I think that one of the big things that finally got through to me, and this hopefully will help somebody, it helped me, and that is if you have that burning desire within you, God himself put it there. And he put it there and he won't let you go because it's what you're supposed to do. So if you have that in you and you don't follow it, you will be in pain. And that's what I was. And so once I started following it, but to follow it, you have to have a lot of trust. Not just in yourself. In fact, I trust myself the least in this process. I trust, I trust God. I trust the people God sends me. I, tr I, I rely on that. And then I learned to trust myself. That's really cool. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like, how to, if someone's feeling like, I guess I'm just kind of wondering if somebody's hearing this calling to go do something and they feel like it's going to be bad for them, right? Like, because that's what you're saying. It's like, and, it's, and sometimes people do have a calling to go do something and it is going to be bad for them, mm -hmm. right? So I wonder, do you have any, I don't know if there's an answer, but do you have any ideas for how to tell the difference? Well, I think for me, um, my test in life about everything is comes from the way that I interpret the third step of 12-step. I'm a 12-step recovery person. I know there's other ways to recover. That's my path. Um, in the third step, it says that we made a decision to turn, turn our life and our will over to the care of God as we understand God. Um, I understand God as love. And so it's not about a Santa Claus God, like, oh, if I'm good, good things will happen for me. It's about um, God is love, so and will is my thinking, and my life is my reality, my manifest, my body, my health, my 
car, my house, my life, right? So if I turn my life and my will, so my stuff and my body and my existence and my thinking over to the care of love, what does that actually look like? So what that does for me is it just presents a question. Is it the loving thing to do? Is it the loving thing to think? Is it the loving thing to say? And if it is, then it's good for you. And if it isn't, then don't do it. Unless you want pain. Oh, I love when you talk about love, Elizabeth. I really do. I remember you talking about that that night. I'm like, sitting next to this person telling me all this cool stuff. It's so great. <laughs> Um, awesome. So, okay, so you're at that place where something shifts and you're like, oh, wait, this, is, this isn't about me. This is about God's will and a gift, right? And so this is at seven years, seven years into recovery. Mm -hmm. and so then, and you, you, you kind of told, you told us the, the quick version. So what was it like to kind of start doing it? Well, I think what happens, and I, this has happened to me over and over again, because of course I've gotten stuck since then and had to pull myself out of all kinds of, you know, it's not like, it's, you know, when they say trudge the road, sometimes you're going up, you know, over rocks and hills and through valleys. Um, it's more like when I have big shifts on the inside, the minute that happens, the outside changes for me. So the minute I get the, I do the work, and then the emotional work on the inside. Then the outside circumstances will follow. And it's usually really quick. And so what happened is right after that, I got that opportunity to start working with Mark. And um, that opened up a huge door because the first performance people were asking me for a recording. I'd never thought about doing the recording because I'd already decided that was too dangerous for me. But I didn't even know that I was still holding on to that old idea. So what I did was, um, what came out of my mouth was, oh, I, have, I knew I had all these recordings because I, they were, and they were demos. And my first record is not available anywhere anymore, but it was really basically eight demos. That's <laughs> what it was. And it sounds like eight demos too, but they're good songs, but that's what it was. And people bought it. And I thought, here's how fear-based I was. Well, I'll just duplicate like 500 of these and oh my god I hope they don't sit in the garage for the next 25 years that's how I didn't even have any after a couple of months I mean it was it went that fast so that that wasn't me doing that that was me doing the internal work and then what happened was because I showed up for God's will that's what happened cool so the first thing you did was so you were like okay this isn't about me and my my grandiosity or like you so said, you got out of your own way, and yeah. then and then so the first thing you did was go and record a song. I well, no. What happened was right after that, I got a phone call from this mutual friend between Mark and I, and she said, uh, "I played your demo because she had the demo. She knew that I was doing the song. She was one of the people who knew about the songwriting, and she had the demo and she played it for Mark. She goes, would you want to open a show for him? He'd like to know if he'd like to open the show." I said, I said, just with me and my guitar, and she said, yeah. And it was a, at the time it was called the Luther Burbank Center in Santa Rosa, but it, it's now I think Wells Fargo sponsors that. It's a theater, big uh, performance um, up here in the Bay Area performance uh, arena, I guess theater mm -hmm. uh, group of theaters. But anyway, so I went up there and I played one song, and he had I don't know it was over a thousand people there, and it was all people in recovery, and it was a recovery song and people liked it and I was totally scared to death to do it but once I did that and then I'm standing out there afterwards with Mark talking to people coming out of the show because that's one of the things we did we would always go out and talk to everybody afterwards um, people would ask me where can we get that song and I knew that I had it in a demo but I thought well I'll just put in a CD because we were going where can we get your CD <laughs> I'm like, I don't have one but the next thing before that came out of my mouth what happened was I went I do have one it's just not in CD form yet. <laughs> so I went and put that together. And uh, yeah, one of the things I did in early recovery before, this is kind of an interesting part of the stabilizing effect of my life was I did go back and finish, I'm one of those people who did go back and finish my um, degree. And so during those seven years, I did develop a lot of uh, self discipline and education. And that was huge in building confidence. So I knew I could finish projects and things like that. 
the confidence, I'd already done the, the hard work of uh, building discipline into my life um, because that was something, I think so many of us who have addiction problems in our teens, we miss those early years where you're really learning how to, how to have that discipline. And so I had developed that in those seven years. And I think that's important to mention because if you don't have the part before your calling down, you might be missing an important part of the foundation. So if you're, and when I was in college working on that and I was in recovery, I was able to really learn a little bit about trusting myself on that level. It was put me out in the real world in a vulnerable way. And, you know, being a, a performer is a very vulnerable thing to do. I mean, it's like, especially when you sing songs like the ones I sing, you know, you're talking about some deep emotional stuff and people are looking at you like, oh my God, you know, and people have opinions and not everybody's going to like you and they don't. And I don't care because it's not about me. It's about getting the music out to whoever's supposed to hear it. And that's not even actually my business. Yeah. And once you get there, it's very freeing. That's cool. I think everybody would like to be at that place with whatever it is they're doing, whether they're performing yeah. or, you know, whatever. Just to know that it's not for, what you do is not going to please everybody and you don't need to. It doesn't need to. It just needs to be uh, true about who you are and express it the way you're supposed to express it and let it be what it's supposed to be to other people and not personalize that. That's great. Yeah, and when people do love it, then, you know, be happy that's about okay that. too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's even better. <laughs> right. Thumbs up. Um, cool. Well, I love that you, you bring that up, that the preparation um, during this, that seven years and how, you know, because I think as, you know, as, as addicts, alcoholics, people are like, well, I just want to get to there. I just want to get to there and we can discount what needs to happen here, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what do, what do you think about the idea? Because we've had some discussions about it, so I'd, I'd love to continue the conversation about what do you think about the idea of people feeling like something's missing or that, they're, that they are being called or that there's, you know what I mean? Like, because we've talked about when we get into recovery and sometimes, and I felt it like I was just supposed to be, I don't think anybody told me this, but I think I felt like I was supposed to just be grateful that I was sober well um, that's I think this is an excellent conversation I love this conversation um, I'll tell you why because I think what happens a lot of people get stuck right here not just not even people in the arts and that kind of thing just in general and people in recovery it, it'd be very easy to just stay in a safe place only around recovered people and never you know because we all speak kind of the same language and It'd be very safe, but I really believe that we're supposed to take our recovery out to the world um, in, in our person because we're, I, you know, there's a lot of really gifted, talented, smart, educated. We have all this human resource, and for so long we are takers. And if we only get recovered and stay in our safe little comfort zones and we never take what we really have out to the world, we're really kind of taking and not giving back in a, in a real, in a, I think a really fundamental way. Oh. Um, so for me, what I, what I believe in and what I hope and encourage other people to do is to grow beyond the fear of going beyond, you know, obviously, my recovery community, unity, service, all those things are very important to me. Um, and it is my foundation and continues to be. And that, that's been a 27-year journey for me now. Um, but if you never take that next step and really branch out and tr learn to trust yourself at the next level and put yourself out there in the, with the rest of the world, um, I think you're ripping the world off and I think you're ripping yourself off. So it's always, for me, it's always growing beyond the comfort zone. And how do I know where to go with it? I really strongly believe that we are all have an internal GPS system, basically. And if you're tuned in and you're doing what you need to do to stay connected with whatever you want to call your, what makes you tick inside, what connects you, um, if you're staying in connection with that, you'll not only get the information, but you'll you'll know that all the resources that you need to achieve those 
things that are in front of you, um, all the resources will happen too. You don't have to worry about it. You just have to show up for it. And I think most people talk themselves out of it because they think they've got to figure it out. So just keep showing up. Yeah. And so um, this is great. I love this. <laughs> and it's, you know how you said, and, and if you're in touch with that GPS, then you're going to know that all the resources are going to show up. And I don't know if everyone is. Like, I think it's hard to know that it's going to show up. So I'm glad that you're telling us because I believe that's true. And I do believe that we can get stuck in the how. So what if somebody... Yeah, stuck in the how. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So if somebody was... Um, if somebody was at that place that we're talking about and they weren't quite sure because, you know, they had a spiritual connection. They were staying sober and being of service and doing all the right stuff. And maybe they're even working a, a job or in the career they were in, mm -hmm. but something's missing. Like, what was it that you were feeling? Did you feel a missing or something? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, I, what I felt was, a, was um, frustration and angst. And, and what it looked like for me was my degree that I worked on in got a bachelor's degree and was in communications and media and so I ended up in the media production world and it paid me really well and I would do that and then I would go do music and then I would go do that and I would go do music and I got this big resentment about having to do this thing that made me money and there's this thing I really want to do. It was this big story that I was telling myself. And, and the reason it's a story is because it's really just a choice of what you're going to focus on. And sometimes you really do need to do more than one thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think um, accepting the humble things you have to do to build whatever you're building is part of what you're, where you're going. It's all part of your journey. So I, I was treating it like there's that thing I have to do and then I really want to go. I'll really be happy when I get here. There is no happy when. Get happy now. And, be, and and the people that you meet in whatever you're doing right now are probably exactly the people you need to meet. Um, and you never know how that's going to show back up. It's real funny because in the music world now, there's a lot of need for advertising and sponsorship to support bands and stuff. And that happens to be my background. And the whole time I was doing that, I'm over here going, oh, I have to do this. I really want to do music. You know, it all kind of goes together. And I think when you trust that process that every single thing that comes into your life there's a meaning there's a reason it's not about discounting anything it's about trying to work at appreciating everything even your biggest problems because those biggest problems are going to probably turn out to be the most important thing that happened to you I know biggest so right there they're in front of you but I'm sitting there going no 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 I, I don't want to deal with that it's just they're no fun when it's happening yeah. So the, the big drama story that you play out in your head that keeps you stuck, that's letting go of that and accepting everything as it is so that you can make a new choice. Because see, when you're in that place where you're trying to push that, um, where you don't want to accept the reality, it's, I'm not saying like the reality, you don't have to like it, but you have to accept it for what it is. The minute you accept it, you have a new choice. But when you're fighting it, you have no choices. Right. No, I'm with you. I'm a big fan of that acceptance. And when I'm not in it, it's just, it just gets pretty uncomfortable. Well, that uncomfortable feeling becomes the problem. So if you just accept it and go, yeah, I, this sucks, I hate it, but it's the reality and I accept reality. Because I think a lot of times, for me, I, I, I hear this from other people who have addiction issues, um, the problem is that we get into this, this uh, fight with ourselves, we fight reality. Well, if you think about what reality is, reality is God and fate and everybody's choices, including mine, all culminating at this very moment. I'm going to fight with that and win. <laughs> okay, it's not going to happen, right? So if I just accept this is here, how it is, this is where I'm at, oh, now I can look at this and go, hmm, okay, well, what's good about this? What don't you like about it? But what, what, and when you figure out what you don't like about it, that tells you what you do want because it's usually the exact opposite. And then you set a new intention and you start taking baby steps in a new direction and it will change. It will change every time. And I think that's when you start to get into that place, you can, you can move through anything. You are a wise woman, Elizabeth. I love how you're sharing. And as you're as you're speaking, I'm like, I'm like, uh huh, uh huh. And then I'm like, she's got 27 years, man. She's she's been, you know, you've been around the block. You've been doing this thing and and showing up and doing it. So, 
from seven years, so you were seven years into recovery and now you're 27 years in recovery. What has this 20 years been like mm -hmm. honoring this gift? Well, a lot of the lessons I'm talking about are, that's, I've learned them from living it, okay? Um, I've had to, uh, the first, well, right after that, when I started with Mark, for the, that next 10 years, what I did was I put out uh, three CDs of original work, and I did it all DIY and went out and did, you know, I ended up on the college campus tours, and I had some nice things happen, so I got involved with the little fair thing. I mean, some really good things happened during that time period. Um, and, you know, that I also had two children. Um, I'd gotten married. I had two children. I was raising kids. I was doing all those things. I was off and on working in different media jobs. Um, you know, obviously I need to make a living. Um, and I had a lot of great things happen during that time. Um, I also had the biggest conflicts were always between, you know, uh, my obligations to my family for finances and what I wanted to do over here. And then also, you know, working through stuff like working with other people in, in, in the music world and meeting people and how does that all work and there's a whole lot of mystique around that and, you know, who knows who and working through, I was talking to a friend the other night about professional jealousy and learning how to deal with all that. I mean, just a huge opportunity for spiritual growth right there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> tons and tons and tons of, you know, what I learned through all of that is the answers are never about the other person. They're always about looking at yourself. So um, no matter what the issue is, I owe, I'm the common denominator in all of my relationships. And so I can't, if I have to wait for somebody else to change to get happy, then I, my chances of being happy are really slim. But if I can change it internally for myself, I can accept it first and then look at my part and then say, how do I want to do this? Or do I want to do this? Make a new choice. So I moved through a lot of that um, during those 10 years. And then I, what happened was life gave me a whole new level of challenge and I had to put my career, kind of my music career to the side. I had um, a family, a close family, one of my children um, had a problem with addiction. As you know, it's, it tends to run, run families. And so my world kind of stopped for a while while I got kind of through that whole thing. What came up for me there was I got a whole new uh, level of recovery through another program. So I'm, like I said to you before, I'm overqualified. Um, I work at this thing and on a lot of different levels, but that all turned out really well and things are in a good place. But it put my, my career on hold for a while and that's okay for me. I, I accepted it because I thought it's not my, I'm showing up for this story. I'm part of the story, but I'm not the author of this story. I'm co-authoring this. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I got to work through that and uh, what happened there, this is actually, talking about this really horrible thing, it felt like a really horrible thing I was going through, not because so much of the music thing, but just the life thing that I was dealing with. Um, but what happened was, um, I started writing songs about it. Because always for me, I go back to that basic thing, I write for myself. Um, and that's why I think when I, if you said what's the core of my calling, it is as a songwriter. And so I got in touch with a lot of healing and a lot of pain and a lot of hope and a lot of all the stuff that goes with loving somebody who has an addiction um, and going through that journey with them. Um, I got to write about that. And that is the songs on this record. Cool. That's great. I love this story. Is there anything, you, you know, you've shared a lot of times I'll say, I'll ask people, is there anything you would share to someone in particular if they were looking for their, if they were in that lost place? And you've nailed it on so many different <laughs> <laughs> levels already. But I do um, want to ask if there's anything that I haven't asked you that you'd want to include. Um, I think I would just want to give some encouragement to people because I know how painful it is if you have like that burning desire in you and you don't know what it is. Just know, just go to the thing that you do know. Start where you are, which is if you know you have something in you that needs to happen, don't be afraid to sit with whatever that pain. It might feel like pain, but every 
feeling has a message tied to it. And the feeling of pain means you need to stop and pay attention. So you need to take a look at that. And so wherever you are with what what is calling you or giving you that feeling of angst or whatever that is, stop and pay attention to how you feel. Because I think what, what for me, I used to fight the feelings all the time, never wanted to have the feelings. And what I've learned is that the feelings are my best friend. They're going to tell me the truth. And so if you can spend some time, you will find your way. Um, finding it and then honoring it, that takes courage. Um, but you don't have to do it by yourself and you don't have to do it all at once. Do it Smart. baby steps. And so if they're listening, you said like to listen to the message, listen to. What, what should they be listening for in the pain? Well... If, like, for instance, the fear that I had of moving forward, what was the fear telling me? Well, I could say, well, the fear's telling me to stop. Okay, what else could it be telling me? Um, it's telling me that I value myself today. Okay, well, does, I think asking questions and having good sponsorship and good friendships and recovery of people who understand how you think, um, who know you, can ask better questions, you'll get better answers. So if you say, oh, well, the fear is telling me to stop, don't trust yourself. Well, have you been able to trust yourself for the last seven years? Yeah, actually I have. Oh, well, maybe it's not the same anymore. So get into a place where you can ask yourself better questions about those feelings. So the fear was saying stop, but the next question said, yeah, it's saying stop and make sure you can tr you value yourself so Make sure you can trust yourself before you go any further. But don't stop at fear. Don't let fear stop you. Yeah. That's great. You know, I've never heard of it that way. But if, when we're in that place, it's so great to have someone who can, with love, challenge that fear. Yeah. Like, check it and, out. And to challenge yourself that way. You know, well, what else could that mean? You know, what else could it mean that you have fear about this? Well, it could be that um, everybody has fear about putting themselves out there. Because everybody's afraid of rejection. Everybody's afraid of being criticized. But what you find out is you will get rejected. And guess what? You won't, it won't, if it's your true calling, you'll keep going. And the next one maybe won't reject you. Cool. And awesome. you will get criticized. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It'll be okay. Because the next one won't criticize you. They'll love you. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What you find out when you face that stuff is... So what? Because if it's your real calling, it doesn't phase you. You just keep going. Cool. That's wonderful. Elizabeth, thank you so much for sharing your story and your, I mean, truly your experience, strength, and hope around all of this. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing, and I love your story, and I love just all the wisdom you're able to share with us, so thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.